where has this recipe been all my life? These people and their potatoes. Why do they eat so many potatoes? Hi, I'm Daisy and welcome to the channel where we explore all foods and holiday traditions by learning about their history and testing out different recipes in a fun and interesting way. Today we're going to talk about St. Patrick's Day and this is my very first video in the new celebration series where we're going to explore holidays from all over the world, learn about their traditions and the food that we associate with them as well as learn how to prepare those recipes. If you have any suggestions for other holidays that I can cover in the series just let me know in the comments down below. And just a quick disclaimer, all of the resources that I found while I was doing my research as well as the recipes that I found are going to be linked down below. First, let's talk a little bit about the history of St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day is a national holiday of Ireland and has a very deep and interesting history. The holiday is named after St. Patrick, who is considered to be the patron saint of Ireland. It is said that he introduced Christianity to the Irish people and there are many legends and tales of his adventures in the land. One of the most famous legends is that he used to describe his faith and the Holy Trinity using the shamrock, a small native Irish clover with three leaves. For over 1,000 years, St. Patrick's Day has been a national Irish holiday, celebrated on the 17th of March, which is believed to be the date of his death. According to Irish Central and Wikipedia, there are over 80 million Irish people living all over the world, and on this day, they celebrate their Patreon and their native country. The very first St. Patrick's Day parade was organized in New York. Until this day, this is one of the largest parades in the USA, with over 150,000 participants. In modern days, this holiday is celebrated by millions of people all over the world, so it's very hard to pinpoint exact traditions. But generally, the celebrations include local parades, people dressed up in green, listening to Irish music, and loads of fun. However, that's not how the Irish people used to celebrate it in the past. It actually started more as a religious holiday, and up until the 1970s, Irish pubs were prohibited by law to be open on the 17th of March as a mark of respect for their religious day. Irish families will attend church in the morning and have a large feast in the afternoon with their relatives and friends. So if you ask me, St. Patrick's Day is not about getting drunk in a pub or a bar or dressing up as a leprechaun and eating chocolate cupcake with green frosting. If you want to try something different this year and make a delicious traditional St. Patrick's Day feast and learn a little bit more about the Irish cuisine, then definitely keep on watching. Irish recipes are warm, comforting, delicious, and they are connected to their history. So for this video, I gathered four interesting traditional Irish recipes that we're going to be talking about and learning how to make today. So our menu today includes soda bread, lamb stew, mashed potatoes with cabbage, and apple cake for dessert. Let's start with the soda bread. The wheat flour that is grown and produced in Ireland is called a soft flour, which is low in gluten and protein, therefore it does not work well with yeast. And in combination with their climate, those two factors lead to issues with baking and rising of dough. And the solution Irish people found is to use baking soda. After it was introduced, baking soda quickly became an Irish favorite because it allowed them to make pastries and bread without having any issues. And not long after that, the famous Irish soda bread came to life. The unique texture of this bread is a result of the chemical reaction between the baking soda and an acid that's also used in the recipe, which leads to the formation of small bubbles of carbon dioxide within the dough. In the past, the acid that people would use was sour milk, but today buttermilk is the alternative used in its place. Another interesting fact about the soda bread that I found is that families believe that if they cut a cross on top of their loaf, it will ward off evil and protect the whole household. This tradition is actually preserved until this day Irish soda bread has that distinctive cross on top. The main ingredients of the traditional soda bread are flour, soaked soda and buttermilk and in some recipes just a little bit of sugar. Today, there are also variations that include eggs and butter, however, for the authenticity of this video, I wanted to recreate a recipe that has only the basic four ingredients, and I'm going to link the one that I chose to use down below. I started by preheating my oven to 230 degrees, then I prepared my own buttermilk. To make it, I put one tablespoon of freshly squeezed lemon juice for every 100 milliliters of milk. During this time, I sifted 540 grams of flour and mixed it well with one teaspoon of baking soda and one teaspoon of salt. Then I made a hole in the middle and started pouring the buttermilk slowly and mixing it in. At some point, I also started kneading the dough with my hands to form it. 
Be very careful with how much you mix the dough. You don't want to over mix it because this will ruin the texture. Also, make sure that your oven is heated up to the proper temperature before you start incorporating the buttermilk into the dough so you don't run into any issues while you're baking. When your dough is ready, put it in a tray with butter, slice it at the top and bake it in the oven. For the first 15 minutes, I baked it at 230 degrees and after that, I baked it for 25 more minutes at 200 degrees. For the main meal, I chose to make lamb stew. The stew is a traditional staple in every Irish household and it originated around the 1800s. This celebrated dish is a favorite of the nation. Probably every household has their own recipe that has been passed down through the generation. The dominant ingredient in this recipe, which is the lamb, had a significant economic importance in Ireland as a source of food and wool. To complement the meat, natives used root crops that they would raise in their gardens, which made this dish easily accessible for all households. When potatoes were introduced to Ireland in the 1600s and due to the appropriate climate, they also really quickly became a staple in every home. Unfortunately, in 1845 began the Irish potato famine, also known as the Great Hunger, when a fungus-like organism spread throughout the whole country. The infestation ruined up to one half of the crop for that year and about a third of the crops for the next seven years. Because the farmers of Ireland relied heavily on the potato as a food source, the infestation had a catastrophic impact on the country and its population. Before it ended in 1852, the potato famine resulted in the death of roughly 1 million Irish from starvation and other related causes, as well as up to 1 million forced to leave their homeland as refugees. Nevertheless, the potato remained loved by the Irish and till this day it's the best addition to this recipe. In modern days, the Irish stew is often prepared with beef instead of lamb, a variety of vegetables, as well as beer or red wine instead of stock. Different adaptations are now being prepared and loved by people from all over the world. But since I wanted to taste the authentic recipe, I actually found a couple passages from different cookbooks from the 1800s and those are the ones that I decided to use. To prepare this recipe, I started by cutting up the lamb meat in large chunks. After that, I put the meat in some butter and cooked it for a little while. Next, I chopped all my vegetables in large chunks. When you take your meat out of the pan, you don't want to remove the juice or the little bits that are left at the bottom and you want to cook your vegetables in that same pan because this will infuse them even further with the flavor of the meat. Next, I added all vegetables except the potatoes to the pan and cooked them until they were ready. If the onions gone translucent, then you're good to go. After that, I added my potatoes, the lamb meat, and poured in one liter of beef stock. To season the dish, other than salt and pepper, I added some bay leaves and thyme. So then I put on the lid, I cooked on medium heat for around 30 minutes and then left it on low for about 2 hours. This was quite an easy meal to prepare with very few simple steps. And the fact that you just leave it to cook on its own for around 2 hours is perfect for hosting because it gives you enough time to prepare your other meals. It contains very simple and easy to find ingredients so I personally think this is a great dish to make for St. Patrick's Day. Next let's move on to the side dish. Another famous recipe where the economical and filling potato is the start of the the dish is the cocannon and I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong I'm not from Ireland I try to find how to pronounce it correctly but if I'm butchering the name I'm really sorry this dish combines potatoes cabbage and leek the earliest appearances of this dish in cookbooks go back to the 1700s now we already talked about the importance of the potato in Ireland but with the cabbage and leeks already being part of the Irish diet, recipes including all three ingredients were inevitable. Now this dish is very versatile and people would also include other ingredients with the potatoes like kale, spinach, spring onions and even bacon depending on their preferences and resources. This recipe is also a great side dish to complement beef or lamb. Now the coke cannon has a fortune telling history that I personally found very interesting. It's one of the dishes prepared as part of the Irish annual harvest festival held on the 31st of October. In the past, people in Ireland believed that on this night, the veil between the different worlds would get thinner, so fairies and different creatures from the other worlds could actually come to our world and visit us. So on the night of the 31st of October, they would prepare feasts and celebrate with their family and friends, as well as light bonfires to protect themselves from evil spirits. 
So on the night of the 31st of October, households would actually hide prizes and charms inside their coal cannon, which were said to predict the future of the family members. The charms of people used varied by location, but some of the meanings remained the same. For example, a coin would resemble wealth and fortune for the person who finds it in their portion of coal cannon. A ring meant that that person would either get engaged or married within the next year, and a pebble or stone would mean that they would remain a bachelor or bachelorette. Although my main dish already contained some potatoes, I thought that the cocannon was the perfect addition to this themed Irish night. To start up, I peeled and boiled my potatoes in some salty water. I also cut and boiled my leeks and cabbage. After the potatoes and the leeks and cabbage are cooked, cool them a little bit, combine them together, add some butter, heat them and mash. It's really simple and really easy. Try it out, see if you like it, but you really need to enjoy cabbage and potatoes in order to enjoy this recipe because both flavors are very strong and you actually taste them while they're eating the dish. For me, it was perfect. I don't know where this recipe has been all my life. And last but not least, let's talk about the dessert. Now, the very first thing that I found was a potato chocolate cake recipe from the 1800s that used to be served with powdered sugar on top. And when I found it, I was like, oh my God, these people and their potatoes. Why do they eat so many potatoes? Like. I mean, I never knew that Irish people loved potatoes that much, but when I found this recipe, I got so excited. And then I realized that if out of four meals, three had potatoes in them, it would not have been good news for our stomachs. So as hard as it was for me, I decided to choose another dessert for this night, but I'm definitely going to make this recipe in the future and try it out because I'm very intrigued by this. Also, I read an article on why they added potatoes in the cake and it's actually said that it keeps the cake moist. I read through a lot of lists with traditional Irish dessert recipes and most of them included things like oatmeal cakes, scones, puddings and desserts that contain fruit, especially apples. In fact, I found a lot of apple pie and cake recipes and since apples are very fresh, I thought they would be the perfect addition to our dinner, so I decided to make an Irish apple cake. I chose to recreate Jem's recipe from Bigger Boulder Baking and I'm going to link her recipe in the description down below. She said that it's her mother's Irish cake recipe and since throughout this video I was trying to find authentic recipes that were passed down through generations, this just felt like it's the perfect recipe for me to try. Now the recipe recommended you should start with the topping first because it needs some time in the fridge while you're making the actual cake. To do this, I mixed sugar, flour, rolled oats and a little bit of salt. After that, I started rubbing cold butter in the mixture to create crumbs. Now it's very important for the butter to be cold, otherwise this will not work. You can see how I'm doing it here in the clip, but basically what you do is you just rub the mixture between both of your hands and this will form crumbles. Once you're ready, just put it in the fridge while you're making the cake. Starting with the cake, I added the butter and the sugar in a mixing bowl and started beating them until they formed a light and fluffy mixture. While the mixer was doing its job, I mixed in a medium bowl the dry ingredients which were flour, salt, vanilla and baking powder. When the butter mixture was soft and fluffy, I added some vanilla and two eggs, adding them one at a time. After that, I started folding the dry ingredients into the wet ones. And for this to work properly, you need to alternate adding some flour, then a tablespoon of milk, and then repeating. Make sure to start and end with flour and fold very lightly so you won't overmix it, because this will ruin the taste and structure of your cake. Then I just greased with butter a 9 inch baking pan and started spreading the mixture on the bottom. When it was even all around, I started layering the sliced apples on top, overlapping them a little bit to ensure that there's enough filling to enrich the flavor. And finally, I added the crumbly mixture on top and baked it for 60 minutes. And when it was ready to be served, I just sprinkled some powdered sugar on top. It's light, it has nice crumbles, different textures, and the apple flavor is just amazing. Really incredible dessert. If you've never tried it, make sure to try it. Like I said, I'm going to link the recipe that I used down below. Overall, I can say that this was a lovely evening for our family. I found that all recipes were easy to create. They used simple ingredients, simple steps. So if you've never tried Irish recipes before, make sure to do so this St. Patrick's Day. 
Also, let me know in the comments down below which holidays you want me to cover next and where you're from and what is your favorite national holiday. Thank you for watching and happy cooking!